I'm going to give you a quick overview on three concepts that are presented in this unit, and those are sequences, indexes, and synonyms. And these are all a little bit different, so this unit's kind of a uh, kind of shove a couple different objects or types of objects into this unit that really don't have much relation to each other, but uh, none of these could really be an entire unit on its own, so it's good to just cover all three in one unit. So the first one we'll talk about is a sequence. Uh, you can see here the code that you would use in SQL to create the sequence. Uh, and I'll give you an example of how you might use a sequence. So take this table, for example. Um, in this table, the, if I asked you what is the unique identifier for each one of these records, uh, if we were designing this table, you might say that the social security number is a natural key. We've talked about keys before. And so a natural key uh, in this case would be the social security number. However, we don't always have a natural key like that. For example, you know, we probably don't know the social security number is for lots of people in a database, for example, or maybe we're not allowed to use the social security number for legal reasons and so forth. So we have to come up with our own surrogate key, right? So we have to make up our own surrogate key, and maybe that surrogate key is just going to be an index or a, a, uh, a sequence of numbers that just increments as you insert stuff into the database. So, for example, Martin McFly was our first person that was inserted, so they get ID number 100. Then Mandy Lopez is 101, then Sammy Jones is 102, then Peg O'Hare is 103, and so forth and so on. So we would just insert, you know, we would just create a new ID for each one of these people as we insert them. Now the assumption here is, and so far in this course, when we insert records into our database, we have been making up that key. We've been making up that surrogate key. Uh, so we haven't been using the database to automatically create those. But what a sequence will do for us if we create a sequence is it will automatically create that next key for us. So to create a sequence, uh, you give it a name, right? So in this case, I called it employee ID underscore sequence or EMPID under S underscore SEQ. It's going to increment by two, starting with 104. Now I chose 104 in this case because my last record was 103. So I'm gonna start with 104. So as I insert new records, it'll start at 104 and I'll let it get up to 1000. Uh, and again, you can set these values to whatever you like. But that's the basic, that's a basic syntax for creating a, uh, a sequence. Uh, there's some other options as well, like cycle or no cycle. So cycle, when it gets to the last digit, it'll circle back around and start with the next digit again. Obviously, if you're using the, uh, the sequence as a primary key, if you allow it to cycle, uh, if the records still exist with the, uh, with the first digit, then your inserts are going to fail if you're, if you're using uh, the sequence. And we'll talk more about um, triggers later on. We'll talk about how that works with sequences as well. You can automate this process. Um, so again, a couple different ways you can do this. But in any event, this is how you create a sequence. Uh, so in this case, as I insert my additional records, for example, if I wanted to insert Keith Emerson and have him get the next ID, which in this case would be 105, let me show you the syntax to do that. We would insert into account manager, the ID, last name, first name, and the values, instead of typing in the next ID, I type in uh, the sequence name dot next val and next val will give me the next value in the sequence. Every time you call a sequence with dot next val, it's going to increment the sequence to the next number. So that means if you try to, you know, if you call next val again, it's going to increment and then next val again, it's going to increment. So you can see here in this example, if I select employee ID underscore sequence next val, the first time I'm going to get 105, then the second time I'm going to get 106, then 107, then 108. Uh, so once you select it, once you call that uh, that next val, it will give you the next value. If you just want to see what the current value of the sequence is, without causing it to increment to the next value, you can call it with uh, .curve val, which you see on the bottom here. So you can also take a look at where the sequence is now, and then you, of course you can use next val to increment it to the next one. So next val is a convenient way to call it for inserting records because it'll just say you know whatever is the next thing in that sequence, it's going to use that ID number. So it's uh, it's pretty easy. When you're done with a sequence, if you don't need it anymore, just like any other object in Oracle, you type drop sequence and then the name of the sequence and it'll get dropped for you. Um, so that's how you work with sequences. Now when we talk about indexes, the way I like to explain indexes is sort of like a telephone book. So, uh, you know, imagine you have a telephone book. Now, my mother always used to do this. When I was a kid, my mom had one of those telephone books. And this was back in the days when, um, you know, we didn't have cell phones with, with uh you know, our entire address book, and you can just look somebody up in your phone. You know, when I was a kid, if you wanted to call your friend, you would say, hey, mom, where's the, where's our, our, our address book? And she, you know, she had this little book. And, and the problem is, when she got it brand new, she would put it everything in an alphabetical order. 
But then as, you know, I would meet new people or get new friends, you know, she would run out of space on the pages for that letter of the alphabet and they would just go to the end of the book. So you can never find anybody by just looking at the, uh, you know, looking in the B's, for example. For example, if I were looking for somebody named Bill Bruford, I wouldn't be able to go to the B's to look up Bill Bruford. I would have to basically go through that list one record at a time until I found Bill Bruford because I didn't know where it could show up. Maybe I could start with the B's and hope for the best. Um, but then I'm like, ah, it's not here. I guess I'll have to start. My mother would, um, she was funny, you know, she, she, she didn't have enough pages at the end and she didn't want to have to keep redoing the book. So she would start putting people in the wrong sections, right? So, you know, Bill Bruford would be under, um, F for Bruford, right? Um, I'd say, why is Bill Bruford under F? And she'd say, well, there's an F in the name, right? Um, so there's no rhyme or reason for it. Well, the database works the same way. By default, every time we insert a record, it's just going to put that record at the end of the list. And if you have a lot of records and you're doing a select statement and you're looking for a specific record, the database engine has to scan the entire table to find that record. We're going to talk about where clauses later, which is how you would filter the results for when you're looking for things in your database. Uh, but for right now, just understand that we're going to be able to do that. We're going to be able to filter the results in our database, and it's going to have to do a full table scan if you're not using something like an index. Now, if this were my phone book, I would probably reorganize the records like this. That way I could find Bill Bruford right away by going to the B's, right? So I would go look up Bill Bruford by going to the B section, and then I would find Bruford under banks, right? Pretty straightforward. That's how a phone book should work. And that's, in fact, how an index works. Now, the uh, if, if this were an indexed table, the row IDs would match the, uh, the, the order in which they should appear based on the... Um, uh, based on the last name, right? If we were using the name field as our index, just like we would in a telephone book. And what would happen is each time somebody tried to insert a new record, all of the records would get reordered in that table to make room for where that new record has to go. Um, so for example, if I didn't have Bill Bruford in my, in my table yet, instead of being added to the bottom, if I have an index based on the name uh, in, a, in a table index, instead it would go right underneath Tony Banks and everything, excuse me, would be in the right order. So there are a couple different types of indexes. The first one um, uh, is uh, is called a, uh, a B tree index. So this is what a B tree index looks like. Basically, what the database engine does is it you know let's say for example we were doing an index on a field called zip, right? Uh, in zip code, let's pretend that we stored the zip code as an integer. That may not be the best idea to store zip codes as an integer, but let's pretend we used the integer for the zip code. We know that zip code should be anywhere from, you know, five zeros up to five nines, right? So the database engine will say, okay, let me find the midpoint for the possible range of values for that index. Then it's going to, uh, it's going to basically take all the records that are before one midpoint and create a tree structure where it stores uh, the index in, uh, in, in continually splitting um uh, continually splitting um, sections, right? They'll try to find the most efficient way to split these records down until we get to the actual record. So if I'm looking up, um, you know, let's say I'm looking up an index, you know, an indexed field for the zip code. If the zip code is 90404, uh, when I when the database engine goes to find that index item, it's going to say, okay, it's greater than 45,000. It's greater than 83,000. So therefore, it must be in that index set. And then it's going to go and find it and then return the row ID. And notice here that the index uses row IDs, right? So here we have four pages of indexes, and it's based on the uh, the row IDs. Now, there may be more than four in, uh, pages of indexes. It depends on how the database engine splits these up. It'll try to do it in the most efficient way possible. But you can see how this is a little bit faster to go and look up a record. So what would happen in this case is when somebody did a query against the database for a record, it's going to go and use this index to locate the row ID, then once it has the row ID, the row IDs are implicitly indexed, right? So now it's easy to go and find that record because you can just go find that row ID in the uh, data set. The row IDs are always going to be in the correct order. So it makes it a little bit easier. All right, so then a different type of index is a bitmap, and these are probably not quite as common, but, um, but a bitmap is where we have very few possible, um, you know, there's not very many possible values. So we can use a bitmap. It's sort of a matrix of all the possible values in each row. And this, um, this again, this is just a m another method for, or a method, uh, excuse me, another method of doing an index. 
Um, and I can tell you the the you know one of the things about this method of doing an index is it only works well when you have very few possible values for a specific column. You can see that if I had thousands and thousands of possible values, the matrix would be very very large, and it would become very inefficient to use a matrix like this. All right. So the other type of index. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the uh, this is the uh, in this slide I have the way that you create the index. So create index, index name on table name with an expression. This is how you create it. It's the syntax. So for example, if I wanted to create an index on the account manager table from our uh, from our examples in the textbook, I would do create index account manager pay IDX on account manager uh, and then get salary would be a function, right? So that's one way I could create an index on, uh, um, on a function, for example. All right, so here's another example. Here we're taking uh, we're, when we're creating our table, it creates an organization index. So this is going to index it based on the primary key. In this case, the primary key is the ISBN. So that means that if I add that organization index, it will always implicitly index this table based on the primary key. So instead of being based on the last record inserted, it'll be based on the primary key value. So so my index, which makes a lot of sense, right? If, uh, you know, if we have a primary key, there's a good chance people will be using that natural key to look up those records. So in this case, I would have a, uh, both the primary key and an index based on that field. So a B tree, just to kind of give you a, a quick rundown here, the B tree, which is the first example, is when you have high cardinality. High cardinality means that there is a lot of diversity in the possible values for that field. So, for example, the, so the uh, not Social Security, but the uh, zip codes have a high diversity, right? There's a lot of different possible numbers for a zip code in a database that, you know, at least a database for the entire country, right? Um, my, my address book has probably low cardinality for zip code because most of the people I know are in certain zip codes, right? And I think that's probably true for all of us. But, you know, a large database of people, for example, so that would be high cardinality. Um, so this is where it, they're also much more efficient when you only are going to have a few results per query. So you're looking for very specific values for that field. So a B tree would make a lot of sense there. It's good for sorting, for joining, which we're going to learn about later on. We'll learn about how to join tables, uh, which is important in relational databases. We'll talk about that later. Um, so it does have high DML latency. If you recall, DML is data manipulation language, which means anytime you insert a record, update a record or delete a record, it's going to have to rebuild this index um, because it has to reorganize that index and keep track of that index. So a, uh, if you have, you know, these high cardinality or these B tree indexes really help with the searching and sorting. But every time you insert or change a record, it has to update that index and it can significantly slow down the performance of a table if you uh, uh, if you're doing a lot of updates on that table or doing a lot of inserts. A bitmap is good for low cardinality, which I already talked about. When there's very low diversity of different different values for a field, um, it's good when you have many results per query. Um, so, and you have uh, about 30 rows per index. And then a function. Functions are always um, uh, if it, it's, it's implicit when you're using a function in a column list that it's going to be indexed. And then you have the index organized table. This is where the table is organized by its primary key, which I talked about last. There's no need for an index table because the table itself is the index, right? So the actual table is reorganized based on those values of the primary key. I will tell you that if your primary key is a natural key that you're inserting, uh, that you're, you're declaring and inserting uh, explicitly, then there will be a little bit of a performance hit on using this type of uh, table. It's going to be similar to B-Tree. But what I will tell you as well is that if you are um, using a sequence, which we talked about first, so if you're using sequences and they're incrementing each time, then the table doesn't have to get reorganized every time you do an insert. So it's going to be much lower latency. So if you're using a table organized by the primary key, where the index is the primary key, and the primary key is a sequence, and it's always incrementing, it's not going to have to reorganize every time you do an insert, unlike if we did something like the ISBN, where it could be anywhere and would have to reorganize the entire table. All right, you could also alter an index or uh, and rename it. Not much you can do with altering. Basically, you can rename it. You can also drop an index if you wanted to. Um, so that's the command to do so. The last thing in your book, and this is relatively simple, the last thing they talk about in this unit is using uh, synonyms. Basically, a synonym is just like in grammar, right? A synonym is just another word for, for that, that means the same thing, right? 
So in, in databases, you can have a synonym. Another name for this is, uh, is an alias, right? So you may have used the term alias where, uh, for example, if you learn about Unix or Linux or something like that, you can create commands that are alias for another command, right? So if I'm on a Linux system, I might make the, uh, the DIR command an alias to LS because I'm used to Windows, right? But it just means the same thing. Um, and that's kind of what we do with our database. So this is where you have an object name and you want to call it by a different object name. And you're probably asking yourself, Brian, why the heck would I, you know, if I know that the object name is, um, I don't know, book, then why wouldn't I call it book? Well, let's say you have an application that's hard coded to call that table a different name. You had to rename it for some reason for a different application, maybe two different applications using the same database. Instead of having two different tables with different names, instead you can just alias one, right? You can use a synonym for a uh, for as uh, one of the names. That way, when somebody calls a table by a different name, for example, it'll just use the alias to call up that table. Um, so, and, and some people do it for security as well. And we'll talk about using views later on. Another way to do that would be a view, but we'll talk about that later on. Um, an alias is just a, or I'm sorry, a, a synonym. In other databases, this would be an alias, but um, it's just a one-to-one -one match. So when you use a, uh, whenever you call an object, it's always going to check first to see if, you know, when you're referencing an object, it's always going to check to see if there's an actual object with that name. If it can't find an object with that name, it'll check private synonyms. And if it can't find a private synonym, it'll check a public synonym. Uh, and if it can't find it then uh, as a public synonym, then it returns an error because that object simply does not exist under any name. So it'll, it'll fail. All right, so that's it. Those are the additional database objects that we cover in this unit.